Um, I wanted to say thanks to everyone here at FIT, the staff as well as the people who specifically worked on our projects. You know there's an old saying that uh, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it takes an army to put together an exhibition and certainly today's uh, symposium. And I'm very grateful to our speakers who have traveled from all over to join us today. You know, I'm probably like a lot of you, always loved fashion, and I certainly have always loved ballet since I was a child. And I think like many of you, I've had images of beautiful women dressed, not only the ballerina, but also women emulating the ballerina throughout my life. But I never thought much about how this phenomenon came to be. Um, uh, aside from the things that I saw as a young child, certainly in my young adulthood, there were many, if you not only literal, but also rather irreverent ways in which things like the tutu appeared in mainstream culture. So when I started off, I just assumed, of course, that there would be scads of information written about how ballets like Giselle, Swan Lake, and even The Sleeping Beauty would have entered uh, scholarship, and I certainly thought that I would be finding a ton of information about this. Now, there have been, of course, scholars who've written about the intersection between the two art forms. In fact, Valerie Steele did a major exhibition on dance and fashion back in 2014, but it didn't answer a particular question for me, and that was when did the shift begin when ballet began to really inform fashion. Fashion designers were really adapting elements from the ballerina's raiment. We know it's a very old art form, and we know since the beginning, fashion had a lot of influence on period costume. In fact, if you look very often at dance costume, you can almost date it. You can see many of the high fashion elements that were incorporated into it. From the founding of ballet in the 17th century, fast forward to the first half of the 19th century, when ballet really began to look like the art form we recognize today. Everything from the point shoe to the tutu took its cue from high fashion. The opposite, however, was not true. Um, rarely did fashion adapt elements from the ballerina's wardrobe and raiment. We'll see a few examples and uh, elements of that this, after, uh, to this morning and this afternoon from our speakers. But for the most part, it was a rather one-sided affair. And it's not surprising, despite the fact that there are beautiful images of ballerinas dating to the second half of the 19th century in Western Europe, such as the paintings by Edgar Degas, we were talking about a very marginalized social figure. Um, one of the ways in which we see this is the, if you will, hmm, uh, positioning of the ballerina. She was a marginal figure, of course, in society like so many performers, but she was also specifically in countries like France at the disposal, if you will, of powerful men like the Abounet who ruled the Paris Opera. And they were so poorly paid that many of these women had no choice but to become prostitutes, basically, in order to survive. So my question was, how did this change so dramatically? Well, ballerinas have always been thought of as great artists, how do they become aspirational figures, ones that mainstream and women who are in the upper echelons of society wanted to emulate? And why did it start in the 1930s, when the interrelationship between the two were prominently featured in magazines, we saw so much couture and high fashion taking elements from ballet, and also the ballerina herself becoming a fashionable figure. One of the things that really sparked my idea in the thesis was a long article written by the great Lincoln Kirstein, the Harvard-educated athlete who did as much as anybody to advance ballet as high art form in America. And this particularly long article not only lauded ballet, but made direct references between ballet and other art forms as well as design and fashion. Voila, I had a thesis. And so again, how did it start? Kirstein's love of ballet didn't just come from nowhere. I think if we had to summarize it, we have two great figures to thank, as well as a whole generation of Russian artists and performers, starting with Sergei Diaghilev, the great impresario, who brings a new and exciting and modern form of ballet to the West, completely reinvigorates the art form, and it becomes, even for fashion people like Diana Vreeland, who said, um, the, Ballet Russe that he brought to Paris was the only true avant-garde she had ever seen in her life. 
The other important figure, of course, was Anna Pavlova, who brought a different uh, form of ballet, but she spread the idea of this art form throughout the world, traveling some 300,000 miles. And Lynn Garofolo will be speaking much more about that later. One wonders, again, whether or not the transformation of ballet in Russia also had something to do with this. Of course, you recognize this great figure, Matilda Shashinska, um, prima ballerina of the Mariinsky, but also famous for having been the mistress of Tsar Nicholas II before he ascended the throne, and also of two, uh, I think only a uh, few members of the royal family, the Romanov family, but they were um, the two that were noted. I'm sure there were others. <laughs> and we see her dressed there in an array of jewels, emulating the very highest members of Russian society. And she did amass wealth and was very well connected. We see this beautiful home of hers in St. Petersburg. It's really a palace. But she was also known to the public for her incredible collection of jewelry, much of which was produced and made by Fabergé. She not only wore it off stage, but she certainly did on stage as well. And some of the critics noted how she absolutely and positively twinkled. And so I think communicating to the audience that she was a woman to be reckoned with. She was not just a performer or a ballerina in the lowly sense. She had really risen far above that. And I think her younger colleague, Anna Pavlova, took note of this. Pavlova was, in many ways, a bit of a fashion plate, although she never amassed the kind of lovers or the jewelry that Shashinska did. She certainly learned the importance of how fashion could be used as a tool to burnish her image. I've always wondered how much of her wardrobe was produced by couturiers. We do have a photograph of her in the exhibition wearing a Fortuny uh, dress and uh, one of our pieces from our collection that shows a great similarity to this. So she was very aware of designers. We know she was wearing designers. Um, how far did it go? Was it somebody like Poiret who could have dressed her? Uh, remains something I hope future scholars will delve into. But she understood that self-promotion was very important, how she was perceived in society and how she was perceived by her fans, both in fashion and in ballet costume, was incredibly important. Even those who had never seen her, people like me, uh, were very touched and moved by the images that she left behind. She had such an impact that certain fashion designers were also um, very moved by Pavlova. This is an example by Elsa Schiaparelli, who created this cape shortly after Pavlova's death as sort of an homage to the ballerina. And I think Schiaparelli took pride in the fact that numbers of times people uh, mistaken her for Pavlova. Now, while the genesis and the creation of the huge phenomenon of ballet's influence on fashion really begins in the 1930s, the genesis of the idea did come earlier. We know that the Ballet Russe did an array of modern ballets, exotic ballets, but also some romantic productions like Les Sylphides, and this particular one with Tam uh, Tamara Karsavina um, as Columbine in Carnival. I suspect those elements influenced designers like Jeanne Lanvin. She was an anomaly a bit in the 1920s, the era of the sort of modern sheath. She created beautiful 18th century inspired romantic dresses um, that were not only called dresses in the style of the 18th century, but were also nicknamed the Camargo after the great 18th century French ballerina. And scholars like Lynn Garofolo have proven that Lanvin was involved in the ballet world as she had made costumes from a number of productions. And so it makes me wonder whether or not this particular piece was in fact inspired by the Ballet Russe production. And again, while there was not a lot of ballet coverage in the 20s, there was a little bit, and some of it quite whimsical as we can see here. I have no idea what this image is supposed to represent, either in terms of the ballet or what fashion element it is. But clearly, uh, pieces of the ballet certainly found their way into the magazines. But this changed in 1932. This is one of the most important articles I found. Um, it was a multi-page spread documenting the ballet Cotillon by George Balanchine, probably the first time his name had ever been heard by American audiences. And this particular piece that was in Vogue magazine did a lot, I think, to really spearhead and start this, if you will, wave of ballet influence on fashion. This particular image, although um, dating a few years after the Cotillon picture, 
It does summarize a little bit about the connections. As many of you know, Chanel was a great designer and a friend of Sergei Diaghilev. She even made costumes for the Ballet Russe. And she certainly was a financial supporter and very close friend of Christian Berard, who was the designer of the Coutillon costumes you saw earlier. It's interesting to think of a modernist like Chanel embracing this whole breadth of romantic style dresses, ballet inspired, and in this particular case, uh, very similar to the Coutillon costumes. But it was all part of a larger wave of neo-romanticism that took over many areas of design, architecture, the fine arts, the performing arts, and certainly classical ballet. We see so many images throughout the magazines of designers like Chanel, again, the modernist, embracing the full sweeping scope of romantic style, tulle gowns. And even a figure like Madeleine Vionnet, a truly avowed modernist, um, there were inklings of her connection to ballet as early as the mid-1920s, as we see on the left. And this particular dress on the right, although it's somewhat balletic, you wouldn't immediately connect it to a ballet costume, except for the caption in Vogue magazine that read that it was a gown for, and they're referring to Vera Zorina, to dance in. Now, while the designer's gowns were very well covered in the magazines and museum collections um, do have a wonderful breadth of examples from that time period, the other thing I found interesting is that the ballerina now becomes a symbol throughout this time period. Starting in 1932, Tamara Tamanova and others were regularly featured as fashion models, photographed by the best in the field uh, and wearing some of the most important couture gowns. She and fellow Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo member um, Irina Baranova were two of the most frequently featured. And it's not surprising because they were also very beautiful women aside from being great artists. What I found surprising, and this is just a little segue, um, is that somebody like Sona Osato was so regularly featured. Um, starting in 1938, this is one of the first images I found of her on the left. Um, she appeared in the magazines pretty much continuously until the early 1950s. And again, this is surprising because of the strong anti-Japanese sentiment that we had in America during World War II. And I've always wondered how this phenomenon came to be. Um, my only theory is that beauty trumps racism any time. <laughs> now, the other thing that we found that was very interesting is that the rise of the ballet culture had a lot to do with what the British uh, brought to the fore. Um, they were the creators of terms like balletto men and balletto mania, and they created really the most interesting and I think um, expansive ballet culture starting in the 1920s. And one of the reasons might be this revival of the Sleeping Beauty, Sergei Diaghilev's version dating to 1921. Although, and the, your dance historians here can correct me if I'm wrong, there were something like 115 performances, which today would seem like quite a hit. Uh, but then it was a uh, real failure, uh, financially and otherwise. Um, but it was important because it laid the groundwork for the creation of what would become British ballet culture. I want to jump quickly to this particular work by Friedrich Ashton, although he was, as he said, infected by the poison of Anna Pavlova, who set him on the course of becoming a ballet uh, enthusiast and professional. He really also loved the ballet russe, including modern works such as Le Tremble and um, Les Biches. And his first work was kind of a riff on that, but had many fashion references. The Scarlet Scissors, or A Tragedy of Fashion, as it was called, documents the world of Monsieur du Chic, a couturier who commits suicide when his work is not well received. Now, he also has a number of other characters in there. Um, as you see, Marie Rambert, she is a central female character, and she was inspired by Dorothy Todd, who was then the editor-in-chief of Vogue magazine. Todd was a very uh, influential cultural figure, having come out of the literary world. But he also had other characters, like the Viscount Viscosa, who was inspired by Samuel Coulthard, a major balletto man, as well as a textile manufacturer. And to the right is the young Frances James. She is the sister of couturier Charles James, who also incorporated many elements, not surprisingly, of ballet into his work. The pink and black tulle gown at the bottom and his sulfide uh, dress that you see to the right, which is actually in the exhibition, are two examples that he produced for the next several decades. As I said, the British were avid ballet enthusiasts, and one of the early productions by um, Friedrich Ashton embracing romanticism was this ballet called Apparitions. And I think, again, like uh, George Balanchine's Coutillon, it's a wonderful fusion of 
historical referencing, combining artists like Cecil Beaton in this case, um, as well as the maker of the costume, Barbara Karinska. And here we have the young Margot Fontaine. But I've also wondered whether this connection between Beaton, the fashion community, and ballet could have found its way as far up as the royal family. <clears throat> a particular gown by Norman Hartnell here, and there's a beautiful example in the exhibition, a very rare one, shows how, in fact, the Queen Mother is almost balletic, theatrical, really, in the way in which she's presented. There's no literal connection here, but I've always wondered whether or not this sort of wafting of the elements had been coming together by this time. Now, aside from designers and ballet uh, professionals, uh, such as choreographers and companies, um, Great Britain also produced some of the most important ballerinas of the time, including Margot Fontaine, who will be the subject of Rosemary Harden's talk this afternoon. <clears throat> what we do know is that she was an incredible example of British-style ballet and was one of the most famous ballerinas in the world. She became an international star after her 1949 highly successful debut here in New York, and she was part of a coterie of British ballerinas who made a huge impact on the world, one of them being, of course, Moira Shira in perhaps the greatest ballet movie ever made, The Red Shoes. And again, that lavish, beautiful movie included many fashion references, including the costumes that were made for her by couturier Jacques Faf. In fact, Faf makes a cameo appearance in the film. We'll be screening it in a couple weeks, so if you do get a chance, I am gonna ask you to just keep your eye out for him in the movie. Now, although British ballet was very important, their connection to Parisian couture was also important. Fontaine was one of the best dressed women in the world, and Dior was her couturier of choice. And there's some marvelous examples in the exhibition lent to us by the Fashion Museum Bath that I hope you'll get a chance to see and which will be elaborated upon by Rosemary. We also see that other ballerinas such as Alicia Markova uh, loved Dior, as did Maria Tallchief, the incredible American ballerina, and Ruth Page. This is one of the 17 Dior dresses she has. And clearly, she understood the connection between fashion and ballet. In fact, her motto was, be adventurous, be chic. <laughs> Dior was beloved by ballerinas and did sort of dabble in ballet costume. Um, this particular uh, production of Les Tres Danses was considered quite beautiful, but almost too subtle for the stage. So while he didn't have a long career as a costumier, he did certainly embrace elements of ballet and his two versions of the black swan uh, can be seen here, sort of at the early part and at the end of his career. The other couturier that I found that was very important was Pierre Belmain. He did an array of gowns covered with feathers, incorporating corsetry, and even other more relaxed elements of the ballerina's costume, such as knitted tops and chiffon skirts. He is one couturier I'd love to learn more about um, because documentation and connection to ballet are so sparse in his biographies. And I want to jump quickly to the United States with George Balanchine um, doing so much to advance ballet culture in America um, and a new aesthetic. While many ballerinas were featured in magazines and were connected to fashion, he is partly responsible for bringing the idea of the tall, slender, attenuated dancer to the fore, and she will be discussed in more detail by Joel Lobenthal later today. But I noted that throughout the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and into the 1970s, it was the dancers of the New York City Ballet who were most frequently featured, Mimi Paul among them. This is one of several times she was um, a featured model, if you will, in leading fashion magazines such as Harper's Bazaar. And again, part of the reason is the similarity between the increasingly long and attenuated dancer's body and those of the models who were featured at the time period. We know that this is not the first time we've ever seen this with particular dancers, such as the great Filia Dubrovska, who had not only a long, lean body, but was also very tall. In fact, here she had to get a special costume by Chanel because the original ones were too short on her for Les Biches. And this is what we start to see as part and parcel of American fashion photography. Models do have that balletic quality to them, long, lean, beautifully toned legs and body. But the Americans also advanced another idea, and that was basic function in clothing, such as the flat ballet slipper. One of the earliest examples is by Diana Vreeland from 1941. But it's Claire McArdle the following year, as the onset of World War II, who starts to go and actually buy real ballet slippers because uh, ready-made shoes were hard to come by at that time because of war restrictions. And the collaboration, she chose Capizio, became a rather fruitful one where the company was actually making custom pieces to go with her ensembles. 
Capizio branched out, created shoes, uh, was on the cover of Vogue, as we see here, and also won a Cody Award, then the most prestigious prize in America. Now, the leotard was also a very important one, and I want to thank Nancy McDonald, who had done so much research. What I love about this is when the idea of wearing leotards and tights became part and parcel of one's daily wardrobe, not just active wear, um, readers were probably a little confused, so there had to be an explanation of what this garment was and how to wear it. And they were looking both to the future, kind of a sci-fi idea, as well as going back in time, looking at the concept of ballet rehearsal clothing as the basis for this. I love the fact that this continued well into the 70s. The 1970s was the great period of dance in America, despite a lot of problems here in New York, such as near bankruptcy, blackouts, rising crime rates. The idea that ballet still played an important role and that this idea of athleisure was already well underway decades before we have come up with and coined the term today. I think one of the reasons also was the greater diversity. We're now suddenly seeing, for the first time, thankfully, African-American women on runways, on the cover of magazines, and we see the rise of young African-American uh, designers who have their own label and are producing under their own name, also in many cases embracing fashion. And finally, a major dance company um, headed by and uh, given over to opportunities for African-Americans to dance and have long-term internationally sustainable careers. It's not the first black company in America, but it's certainly one of the most important. And also that its dancers branched out into fashion. Um, Lydia Barca, a great dancer whom I'm sure many of you remember, may have been the first dancer to get a cosmetics contract, and she did so in 1973. <clears throat> with the then wildly popular Charlie Fragrance campaign. Now by the 1970s, ballet was waning, um, not surprisingly, and I've always wondered whether that great heyday was in part due to the deaths and retirement of these two great figures, George Balanchine and Sir Friedrich Ashton. Just as Diaghilev and Pavlova ignited ballet, they in some way signaled a kind of, if you will, um, falling if you, uh, within the cultural realm but thankfully, since the new millennium, ballet has come back. We see ballet everywhere. Its costumes, especially those echoing the uh, ballerina's tutu, have been increasingly important. And they bring back ideas for we curators to look and examine again how ballet has directly influenced fashion. Even designers and costumiers, such as Mark Happel, is uh, demonstrating his connection to fashion and interest in historic couture. He noted that this particular Balenciaga inspired the scalloped edge of the costume we just saw from Symphony and C. And I've always wondered whether Margot Fontaine's costume some may have influenced uh, Balenciaga, because that's a rather unusual garment for him. And that the embroidery from Christian Dior's work, uh, an example of which we have in the exhibition, also influenced uh, the costumes that we now see on stage. So this fluid moving back and forth between the dance form, between fashion, between dancers, between models, between everyday consumers of fashion, have really benefited, if we will, from the rise of ballet culture in the early 20th century. Now, while I can't speak to ballet and its importance, I'm only a neophyte, although I love the art form, I can say that I do believe, and I think you will agree, that the ballerinas have not lost their emancipated position. For us, they are human, they are superhuman, and perhaps that's why they will always be our muses. Thank you. <laughs>